Welcome chamber members, Strathcona County residents and everyone that is viewing from abroad to our second of three events that we are hosting this week to celebrate International Women's Day. International Women's Day is a global day celebrating the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity Significant activities is witnessed worldwide as groups come together to celebrate women's achievements or rally for women's, e women's equality. The campaign theme for International Women's Day 2021 is Choose to Challenge. A challenged world is an alert world, and from challenge comes change, so let's all choose to challenge. My name is Todd Banks, and I'm the Executive Director of the Sherwood Park and District Chamber of Commerce. It is my privilege to facilitate today's event. So let me introduce our guest speaker. Pauline Melnick is a highly influential change specialist and professional certified coach, attuned to workplace restoration, sustainable and regenerative leadership. She approaches teams with professionalism, passion and dedication to client service, health and success. Her company, Melnick Consultancy, is a leader in North America in accreditation of change management professionals, working with executives, corporate leaders, and individuals across sectors. Pauline is, great. Pauline is a great thought partner for future-focused leaders of both public and private sector organizations. As a certified member or associate of a dozen professional organizations, she brings individual and organizational development to every level of transformation and comparison for human transition during change. When you work with Pauline, you know you will be stretched to engage your employees, demanding your business practices to evolve, innovate, and remain relevant and ensure they are psychologically safe. Pauline, welcome and please proceed. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate being here and I appreciate giving the opportunity to me in honor of International Women's Day. I think it's a week, but it's probably more than that. And most people will agree. Uh, our theme today is about uh, building healthy and productive teams. And for those of you that have not met me in person, um, you're first gonna notice that I have an Australian accent. That Australian accent uh, that you're hearing, you're thinking, why the hell am I here, right? I choose to. It's my life. It's my love. And it uh, gives me an opportunity to actually sit here. But in total honesty, I'd prefer to be sitting underneath a tree in the middle of uh, Stradbroke Island. Just imagine that for a minute. Facilitating team training from there and or supervisory development for my local Kondamooka community team. The shared learning that comes from the steep belief in Aboriginal laws and governing the correct ways laid down means that we've got no electronic devices, no photographs, not even allowed to approach unless invited. So each and every day I choose to show up. What part of you is given permission to holding the space for the team? For me, it's my heart to deeply listen and to give us an opportunity to create change from a place of uh, definite vulnerability, the ability to lean in with your team. I choose passion and joy and contributing positive attitudes and mindsets to my teams, giving an open mind, an open heart and a willingness and a desire to learn. As unique and as worthy as other cultures, companies across the world from APMG uh, to InSync to physicians, mental health, um, environmental, nonprofits, local community uh, businesses and governments, all are figuring out their path to their team. And I work both on the global stage as well as with public and private industries. In fact, this morning I've come from working with teams across 
uh, the US, as well as teams across the world uh, for very large corporations. So it's always good to attend virtually. And I actually am very grateful for COVID. <laughs> it's given me a chance to actually have my world on my stage. So um, I live and work here in the park virtually. I belong to and work with leaders um, in international boardrooms, meetings and training sessions. Um, it's a challenged world out there and I get to see that um, at every level within uh, organizations where individuals are responsible for their own actions, uh, where thoughts every single day as we deal with the complexity and the social complexity in that there's social and economic pressures because of COVID. Um, I, and it's not just because of COVID, it's because of the every single day that we come to work and show up as leaders um, that we have to deal with that. I've observed our teams being tired, fatigued, overwhelmed, in conflict, confused. So what if you had the capacity to make a significant impact today from your position where you are today here in Sherwood Park with your teams in the depth of your company and or your business, would you or could you make that step? What should you do to manage your path forward? So whether you're considering facilitation, conflict management or leadership, understand your team is made up of individuals that they need a strong voice, they're deeply passionate, they're diverse, they're skilled, and they're privileged. All employees want one thing, and that's to be heard and to be seen, to contribute, to be treated respectfully and with civility. It so happens that this week and today falls also where the Canadian Mental Health Association is dealing with their working together and working stronger conference. So if you've not had a chance to attend that, um, take a moment to look it up. Your employees are less willing and you are less willing to be exploited or coerced into a viewpoint or norms that are outdated in your workplaces. How do you make the transition? So that's where my work comes into it. Um, it's possible that your team might feel disrespected during these moments of, of change. Perhaps they're unappreciated. Perhaps you don't feel the appreciation as their leader. Might there be alienation or disengagement? Affiliation? Is there a sense of belonging at your workplace? Is there an independence? Is there limited independence? Do you have the autonomy to do your work? Is their role satisfying? Is your role satisfying? Is it unsatisfied or unrewarding? So what is your role in that and helping people bridge that gap? Perhaps they feel diminished or put down. Perhaps there's a status thing going on in your workplace. As a change coach and a agent of change and working with organizations across the world, I get an opportunity to say, if so, if these things are happening, why? And so that's where I get to choose to challenge. So where do you get to choose to challenge? Each and every day, you'll get to challenge in your workplace. So think for a moment what I actually spoke about with regards your change. When we think about the system that we're working in, that individual perception is based on your own environment and whether it's um, uh, working for you, what's the trigger, the catalyst to the change that you might have, the reaction, what would it take to build a perfect day for your team? What would it take to build a perfect day for your team? So back on that beach in the middle of Australia, that was a perfect day for me. Being able to train and to deliver team training in the middle of nowhere 
and to take it as we as we did um, on the beach there and to learn both not only what I needed to share, but also what my Indigenous elders were working with me on. So employees are asked to do more. Can we create that space for them here in our own workplace? So if they're asked to do more, or if they're asked to do nothing that they've done before, then you need to actually spend time as a leader to managing that new way. So we can't, cannot change the system if we don't allow the system to see itself. Above the waterline is what we actually see there, the events that we're reacting to. What just happened? For most of you, you've dealt with a COVID situation. Um, and what were the patterns and trends? What did that tell us? If we don't give an opportunity to see and sense the system in underneath the water, what's going on? Underlying those structures, what's the design? How have we designed our workplace? Have we designed meetings where we just show up and we don't get an opportunity to speak? Do we intentionally leave people out of the workplace by not sending them emails, by overwhelming them with too much information? I perhaps did that to you as I sent you information, okay? It certainly triggered some to thinking that they had homework to do, okay? So during crisis, we need to stop doing certain things. That's our own mental model. Let go of what we need and what we're holding on to and perhaps start doing some collective sense-making, start doing something differently post-crisis. What would you restart? What would you amplify? So restarting some old practices, but amplifying some of those new practices. What have you learned? How have you celebrated that in your team? That's the beauty of the work that we've been doing. If we're developing a team across the world, doesn't matter where we are, we need to facilitate every single meeting not individually, but collectively, bringing people together, everyone taking responsibility, showing up, turning up, speaking up, helping create that environment. It's not just about one person doing the work. It's not always about the leader leading that. And yes, they may have the paid capability of doing that work, but it's about how you service the team yourself. So how can you solve problems from that place? Think about that system. Think about the questions that you need to ask. Think about how you make decisions in your organization. What do you need to coach or enable your teams to do to think differently? And some really good questions about asking yourself at every stage. What's kind of going on? Just have a moment here to think about what's kind of going on in your world. I'm going to raise your hand. First of all, you're going to have to know where to find it. It's in the emoticons. Okay, so you're going to use the emoticons. You're going to raise your hand. How many of you believe teamwork is essential for achieving the results in your team? in your organization. So I'm still finding their hands. The first one, I'm gonna give you a little bit more time. Go ahead to the motocons, you wanna raise your hand. So that's your first choose to challenge. How many of your organizations espouse teamwork as a core value? Not just the written rules of your organization, but actually live it. It's not just something on the, on the uh, page. Is there something in there that I'm going to see contradictory? 
So if myself or somebody else comes into your organization, are they going to see something different? Again, we've still got folks thinking about this question. You're multitasking. You don't need to write these questions down. It's what I sent you in an email. And you will have that in a moment. So be fully present with what I'm asking these questions for you. How many of you regard teamwork as a leadership core competency? These questions are meant to challenge you not only as a, te as, a, as a team lead and or a facilitator and or a team member. You always want to make sure that you're actually thinking, where do I put the pressure on the team management role? Thank you for the folks that are responding. How many of you spend time developing the teams you lead? It's one of those things is we're always at a budget, never have enough space, never enough time in our budget to do these things. And we have about 18 or so that are actually putting some genuine time towards that. And I'm not talking about you have to do the formal, go off and, you know, sort of do a, a weekend retreat with your team. I'm talking about day in, day out. How many of your top management spend time developing their teamwork? Does the top leadership team do things? Little COVID um, statistic at the moment, most folks in most organizations, some of the largest of organizations, they're actually, this is where there's a diversity and inclusion kind of component to this is most of the teams, the executive leaders are actually spending more of the money to do their leadership training. Um, and it's not getting down to the lower levels. So I really want you to think about the diversity and challenge who is there. But that top of the chain needs to be able to work together. So really consider how you're spending your time. How many of your senior leaders believe and are committed to effective teamwork? I think it's an espoused value for most. So your influence on your team doesn't have to come from a formal place of work. What you can do in your organization is really learn to persuade and to encourage and to develop from within. And as we get to this uh, slide, you're going to see both the slide you saw before, which is the systems thinking. So I want you to be thinking about what's going on, what happened on this right hand side, you know, sort of what trends and, and things are happening, the patterns and the trends. So if we think about the change curve and we think about what's above the line and we're talking about that midline between uncertainty and skepticism, if we think about that, we think about the virtual world that we've moved into and people are moving down this chain. Now, if we work with trauma and we work with grief and we work with our teams, and we're working through change, they're going through this emotion regularly. What we do in change is we try and reduce the dip, and that's what we call um, our resistance to change. Okay, so working with teams give you the ability to actually help build this organizational trend. 
So all of those emotions, most of the time we want just their hands and their feet at work, right? Um, we very rarely ask for anything else from our employees, right? Perhaps they're bringing in everything that's going on in their home life into their personal space. Maybe, maybe the new term is that we're not just working from home, we're actually, we're living at work. And so as you move from uncertainty to skepticism, in this ending zone, we really want to let go of things that aren't serving us. But it's not the place where we're actually going to deal with an individual in our organization that's un unhappy. They're confused, if they're frustrated, if they're reserved, maybe they don't know what's going on. Maybe they're in denial. They don't want to wear uh, certain PPE. Um, maybe they want to move into this other place. This is the catch in the bottom here is where we're starting to deepening that, that component. It's deepening below um, and getting into self. So in this top part, I don't know whether you can see my mouse moving. In this top part, you're going to see that you've actually got um, them blaming somebody else. And so if you're listening to the words that they speak, they're blaming somebody else. So maybe it's the government's fault. Maybe it is, you know, their partner's fault. But as they deepen down into this curve and down to the bottom, they start to actually realize and recognize their own place in this. That's what I'm hopeful as a leader that you're starting to think about. It's your role to actually get in there and work with your teams to build those healthy teams. So think of the contradictory components between the yes above the line and the no below the line. What you want to ask your team as they move up this other side and you can help them move from them individual self all the way up to this other side is by asking them to think of the negative consequence of having a yes. So what is the negative consequence of having that yes? Saying yes to opening, saying yes to actually uh, delivering on something. But what might be the positives and have that conversation of having a no? What's the positive of having a no? And saying no to the actual work that you're doing. No to that extra meeting. Consider renegotiating the conversations you're having within your organization. Consider the values about what a healthy and productive workplace would look like, and what a healthy and productive team looks like. Have you had that conversation? So in the context of your employee teams and your leadership teams, this you process requires deep conversations. You're building intent. You're observing, you're connecting to that source and that inspiration and that will, and you're moving to prototype perhaps a new way that you're gonna work with the team and embody some new kind of belief. And I'm not saying you do it overnight. I'm saying it takes time. So all of this happens over time. And so you'll need to actually make sure that you actually reduce the amount of resistance in there. So in the, in the you process, you're going to get victimhood, you're going to get um, trauma, you're going to get imbalance, you're going to get fear. How do you respond to that? We deeply listen. And when we're actually challenging, and we're actually challenging our teams in a virtual world, we need to set some boundaries for folks, both personally and individually and choose to challenge how we're actually running virtual meetings. This is a way of the world and you need to spend a little bit more time in the building of relationship when it comes to being in the virtual world. As I said, I work across the world quite seamlessly actually. Um, and here, you know, we struggle to say, okay, how do I, how do I set up Zoom? How do I engage my team? Um, so what do I need to do? Um, and so really think about 
learning and I've given you a dozen tools. I've even given you, you know, sort of like snippets of, of my world, which will help your teams. I'm helping you cheat <laughs> so that you can look positively something, you know, the next meeting that you set up, really think about what's the condition and build in some space. So while teamwork's an espoused value, the rewards of only go to the individuals, right? In the virtual world, we're changing that. In the virtual world, individuals become less, teams become more important. So well-designed teams incremental, incrementally increase um, the ability to survive and thrive um, as an organization. Real teamwork and cohesive leadership really help you plan. And I think uh, Erica did a really good job on Monday. If you managed to get a hold of Erica's presentation, go ahead and watch that. Um, with implementation and supports and moving towards that direction. So join in um, with, you know, sort of even on Friday with what you're gonna hear more about the trauma component and dealing with those emotions. So on Friday. So just one of the opportunities to lead your team and build alignment across um, the organization. There's internal organizational boundaries. Um, you might want to actually consider, you know, sort of what your core challenge is when it comes to actually what's being implemented. So just some of the opportunities around your customers is what you have currently. Do you know the... Uh, quality of the employees that you actually have? Do you know what knowledge and expertise they have? What materials do they need to do their job? COVID's given you enough opportunities to actually look at that model and then what funding do they need to actually support that role? And I think when we came to designing our response to some of the uh, changes, we really looked at designing from the top down rather than the bottom up. And so you really want to look at the role. So really acknowledge the authority and status within the organization, but also consider what and who you are and what you're bringing to the table. But invite your team members to bring their unique talents, their strengths, their passionate pursuits, their values and beliefs and their missions and their purpose. And this component of their work is all about making sure that they have internal coaches or external coaches. So if you're a leader in this space right now, have you a coach? Do you have a coach? And so that's vitally important to helping you really remember who you are in that process. Coaches aren't just for leaders, though. They're for all of your staff. So consider group coaching and just have somebody else come in to help lead the team and be that coach on the team. One of the key pieces of work that I did with the government of Alberta was around coaching teams and sitting with teams. So just one of those opportunities also helps you build um, alignment across the organization and help you build um, alignment with your customers, engage your suppliers, get them involved in the conversation. What does an external business partner do for you? Virtually choose to challenge the norms, choose to uh, have dialogue about why you're having uh, virtual. And in order for you to function, if you don't challenge, if you don't challenge the status quo, you won't understand what it is that you need to do. So what's your desired outcome? If you want a healthy and a productive team, what do, must be the priority there? Team. So if you focus on the team, the team will carry you through. And so for those organizations that I've worked with over COVID, they've been spending a lot of time engaging their team members. Engaging, engaging, engaging. Be it an existing or a developed team, all teams go through this curve of forming and norming um, and storming and or performing. Every team does that. But you'll notice something with Tuckman's model is that this little dip here resembles that same change curve. 
okay? This is intentional practice around Tuckman's model, okay? And we'll get more into Tuckman in a, in a moment, but if you're moving from forming to storming, we need to actually do some actions. How are you onboarding people? How did you onboard them to um, the COVID and economic times that we, we laid? Most of us retreated. How many of your leaders retreated? How many of you paused in that moment? It was a good time to pause, but it was also a good time to listen to your teams and to engage them in a different way. So think about the economic times that we have up uh, going on at the moment. Some of you have had to what we call a little bit of an extension from here, adjourn your teams, okay, meaning lay them off, send them home. Um, to work from home, we've changed the structure of the way that they actually can do their work. So we've isolated them. And so some of that impact is vitally important in how you're actually going to restructure your team. So you need to engage and you need to be talking to them. There is a deep grief process in this at this very bottom. This is the time you need to have people come in and help you so that you can actually move through that. So what's going on? And I'm not saying that you, you need somebody because you don't know how to do it. I'm, do, I'm saying you need somebody so that they come in with fresh eyes and they come in with uh, a, a real definite to protecting and serving you as well, okay, and helping you through that change. Make sure that when we look at this next model, this team performance model, and these models get larger and you do have a copy of them, is it really, again, we're dropping down into that you and there's some certain processes in there that Sivet and Drexler have actually um, designed around intentional and creating the, that sustainable team. And so Drexler's model is very important and we'll talk more about the wow um, component of it. But as you move through, what I come up against all of the time with um, different organizations is really what Lencioni describes as his five dysfunctions of a team, right? And we all are guilty of this in every moment of our day. And so if I was to go back to that beach, if I was to go back in underneath that tree and teach, there was attention to results. There was attention to detail. There was trust. There was conflict. And it was healthy conflict. But there was also commitment to making change in that organization. And there was also accountability to hold them um, to that organization. So think about your teams. Think about what they're actually going through. I've given you a tool that you can take away um, I've dropped it into your emails this morning. Yes, that was. And it is a team culture audit. I suggest you do it with your team. I've put the instructions there. I've, I've stolen it from good books like Building Smart Teams, okay, uh, BD, BD uh, Baker and Scott. Um, and, you know, sort of you can download this for your teams, get each of your team members to actually complete it and have a conversation with them. Talk about what it is that is the difference. What's the plus side of saying yes to something that you've said no to? What's the positive of saying no to something? Okay, what's the unintended stuff that's going on? Other team books that you can look at, there's a new one out um, by uh, some Canadian authors, some local Canadian authors. I've actually worked with both of these people. Um, it's called Peak. Um, it's how to work with teams. And it has a little, you know, sort of uh, association there with, you know, sort of um, um, friends. And so, you know, sort of culturally, your teams are used to doing certain things. So go ahead and look at that from a cultural point of view. Um, if you choose the next step um, in dealing with uh, your teams, you need to start looking at managing jointly what the team problem solving is. And this is the manager's responsibility. You've got to build in conflict resolution components. What's the synergy and the communications that's going on? 
Again, another little assessment that you can do with your team. Consider how to frame those disagreements. This is where it always turns around and um, helps people to understand who's responsible for it, but also how have you built it into your organization um, and be more interactive. What emotions are going on for folks and how do they deal with it? Um, I always ask that you can um, get each of the individuals to show up and use the team contribution shield. So the team contribution shield you'll have in your Dropbox, in your emails as well um, from the registration. Go ahead and, you know, sort of use that with your teams, get them to do it individually, and then have the conversation uh, in the workplace. And one of the key things in this one is really identifying what some of the, the bad things that I do that kind of annoy people at work, okay? And so that they're actually having that conversation as well. So if we think about what your mission and your purpose is, and you think about who you are, you need to move people through this process intentionally, whether they're actually just new to the organization and or existing members. Um, any change that happens, they're always going through this stage and it's very fluid. You don't just get to performing and forget it. To stay performing, we need over time, we need to keep coming back to this forming, norming, storming, okay? The biggest part around storming is understanding roles. Who does what, when, and where? And conflict occurs at that particular point. Engagement occurs in that particular moment. So if we think about Lencioni's five dis dysfunctions of the team, we got to think about, you know, sort of where are we building um, attention to women in the workplace, okay, and where women can actually show up or where the diversity occurs. So the Australian Woman of the Year for the senior category this year was a woman called Miriam Rose Ungamir Bowman, and she has reached over 70, she's 70 plus, I won't give you her exact age. She's an educator, she's an artist. She has serious concerns for the health and mental and social disorders of her, her community. Does this sound like you? That you've reached a point where you have a strong interest in the power of restoration. And Miriam Unger, Ungermere, um, she actually, um, won that Order of Canada, uh, Order of Australia. I wish it was Canada. Um, Order of Australia. And she teaches us that women do incredible work. Okay. And I'm going to share with you at the very end a little video from her. Um, so, so consider who you're going to nominate locally um, as well in your organizations. Little test. Quickly draw nine. Some of you may have already done this. Some of you may know. Quickly draw nine dots on your page. Can you think outside the box? Can you use four straight lines and pass through those dots with a pen? Can you think outside that box? It's one of the simplest tools that you can engage your team with the next time that you're working with them to express that you want to actually think outside the box. How do you restore problems in the organization? How do you turn them around? How do you flip them? Has anybody got the solution? I should before. Yep. We've got some folks that are nodding their heads. That's your answer. Don't leave you hanging. Okay. So as you consider, you know, sort of Drexler Sibbett's model, think about why you're here. Think about who you are. What goal clarification you've got. Okay. And have you been clear as a leader as to what you want your team to do? 
And then how are we going to do it is that place that the rubber hits the road in order to project everybody up and out. So think of this as a rubber ball. If anybody's played four squares before. So you want to actually come down. And again, we're mirroring that U process. Gain that commitment and move up towards implementation, high performance and renewal. So consider that break, that, uh, that bouncing ball. Notice any patterns that your team is contributing to and what it might be doing. Go ahead and give me your questions. Todd's gonna review some of them, um, but I'm gonna talk about my association with, you know, sort of, um, when you consider, you know, sort of your understanding about humans and how you need to deeply listen to the stories and you have to sit in uncomfortable places. You need to think about the equality and or the equity that folks are seeing. You're going to witness grief. You're going to witness uh, violence. You're going to witness trauma um, at all society levels. And so give you the opportunity to really define who it is that you are in that moment. So for me, living in Canada is a challenge every single day. Being a leader in this community goes unrecognized. Um, and so this opportunity that I work with uh, some local level um, has been wonderful. And I have some amazing friends in the community um, that help and support me along that journey. And I'm a part of a team that, you know, sort of is not necessarily always an opportunity to um, really be who I am and who I'm with. And so when you consider the teams that you work with, how are you allowing everybody to show up? Okay. Paulina, I have a question from John. How do leaders bring teams out of the dip when there is high uncertainty, such as reopening from a global pandemic? Yeah, so what is not uncertain? Most teams are doing and spending their time having a conversation. That's a really good question, John, because I would actually take that question to the team. I would actually engage the team. And if I needed to do a pessimism session, that's what we would do. We'd have a, we'd have a pessimism session We'd structure it around um, what we need to do differently. Sometimes a big beef session um, for the team is often um, well sourced. Again, have somebody like myself, uh, a coach. We have some amazing people in the community that can help you stretch to that area. Great. Any more questions, Todd? Yes, uh, Laurie Fensky is asking, understanding that we need to continue to build our teams virtually during this time of remote work, how can a leader discover new ways of engagement? Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully I've demonstrated some, Laurie. Um, hopefully I've demonstrated that, you know, sort of you have to engage them online, but you need to engage the conversation. And the, the biggest thing is really listening. Um, I always suggest that you, um, Leaders only need three rocks in their pocket, okay? And they get to use those three rocks for questions that they ask. So that's, um, make, them, make those questions really powerful. Ask questions of your team. How do they need to be supported? How do they need to show up? Perfect, thank you. Uh, Sue Timmonson, her question is, how do you lead through continued uncertainty? We know things are getting better and intellectually we know they will, but there's still such a strong sense of uncertain, uncertainty that may hold us back. Having a plan will help, but even the best plan will be slowed or held back if we can't address the uncertainty. So uncertainty is actually um, something that your team will answer, right? 
have that conversation. Should we stay open? Should we not stay open? Um, it's hard to know with where can you find certain things? Where is there certainty? There's certainty in the sense of the union and the, and the ability for you to actually be together. So, you know, sort of it, it, the uncertainty, who are you looking outside of to get that answer? Okay. So where you have to go within. So if you think about what it is that you would do differently, if, you've, if you had an opportunity to listen to your team, you'd be surprised at how many solutions come from that team. So those organizations that um, I'm working with um, across the world, they're leaning in. They're leaning into the conversations. There's some difficult stuff happening, you know, across the world. Everybody's experiencing it. Um, but understand your why. Why are you doing this? Who are you, who are you standing up for? So think about it um, as you deal with that. I mean, some of your teams are going through some deep grief, okay? And they're being caused by some of the work that we are actually been doing um, with COVID, okay? And our responses to it. And it's normal. It's okay for them to have some grief. Don't expect them to be, for, be performing on the stage for you at every stage have a conversation, listen, deeply listen. Any we other questions? One. Yes, we have one from Carla Howitt. What happens when the official leader is not the natural leader? And then I think there's another part to it here, when the natural leader is not the official leader. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who the leader is, is my answer to that. What's your expectation? So if you have an expectation, go back to that culture audit. If you go back to an expectation that somebody else is going to solve this for you, then it's the wrong expectation. As a team, you need to, everybody at the table, everybody has responsibility for it. They can't speak for you. They can't speak um, on behalf of you. You have to have be in conversation with them. So you need to have a conversation and step into that space, be uncomfortable with that space. Um, and the deepest way that I can show that is by sharing with you your gift um, for today. I did share um, it in the email as well, but I'm going to hand it over to Todd while I do the queuing up. Okay. Do you have time for one more question? Paul? I do. Okay, perfect. So Redwater Chamber of Commerce, a great chamber within the Alberta Federation of Chambers. How does a team leader work with a team member who is adamant they want everything their way and is relentless until they get their way? Mm -hmm. So again, diversity and inclusion means that something needs to be able to be heard in that system. Okay. So we know that we can't have everything our, our way, but if we have a deeper conversation with the team and be honest with the team, most of us are just skirting around. So I'm not trying to be um, avoidant of the question. What I'm saying is most of us are skirting around because we're not actually listening. And that person that's actually just demanding just for themselves is not listening. And so we have to take them into the space of helping them listen. And from Danielle Kluster from Central Alberta, I'm interested in hearing more about teamwork as a leadership core competency. Uh, do you mean leading teams or being part of a team or something else? I think it's, I think it's yes and, Danielle. <laughs> I think it's yes and. It's, it, it's everybody has a place in the team. It is collective. OK, it's just like it's collective in society. If we're acting as individuals then we will not solve these problems across the world, we need to act as a collective and we need to invite space into there. We need our uniqueness and our ability to be unique and not clones in our organisations. But we need to have voice. We need to be able to be safe when we have a question. We need to feel like we're not being coerced um, or displaced. 
And there's a reality if we have that conversation, particularly where people are returning to work um, and they're stressed, okay, is to provide the additional supports for them. Okay. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions. I think we've answered them all and you're going to show your video now. I certainly am. So thank you so much. So as I share this video, I want you to think about Miriam Unger, Rose, and um, who she is and what she's offering uh, from an organizational level. And it's a little something that you can share with your team. Enjoy. To know me is to breathe with me. To breathe with me is to listen deeply. To listen deeply is to connect. sound, the sound of deep calling to deep, da -di -di, the deep inner spring inside us, we call on it and it calls on us, we are river people, we cannot hurry the river, we need to move with the current and understand its ways. We wait for the rain to fill our rivers and water our thirsty earth. bush foods and wait for them to open before we gather them. We wait for our young people as they grow. The time for rebirth is now. If our culture is alive and strong and respected, it will grow. It will not die and our spirit will not die. I believe that the spirit of Dadidi that we have to offer will blossom and grow, not just within ourselves, but in our whole nation. Thank you, Pauline. Do you have any closing remarks? I would just like to say thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity. And uh, it is an important, important day to um, be able to share with folks um, as we go through. So I know I've kept you over time. So hopefully you've enjoyed. Well, thank you, Pauline. And on behalf of the chamber members, residents, and all guests today, we want to thank you for your valuable insights and advice.
especially in such a busy uh, life that you have. So it's very much appreciated. In appreciation, we'd like to, uh, well, I'm pretty sure we've delivered a bouquet of flowers to you, uh, but uh, that's a small token of our appreciation. And they're from a great member of ours, Funky Petals. Thank you, Funky and Petals. <laughs> thank you to all participants online today for joining in. Sorry, Pauline, I cut you off. Nope. You're good. Okay. We will have a recorded version of Pauline's presentation on our Chamber website soon. So please let us know. Um, others know that you, they can see our presentation. I would like to thank Sean and the team at Strathcona County Economic Development and Tourism for sponsoring our events this week. Without their support, we could not have provided such great lineup of speakers such as Pauline. So thanks, Sean, for your generous support. I would also like to thank four ladies from our board of directors that volunteered their time for our International Women's Day Committee, Lori Fenske, Janet Suchatsky, Pam McCormick, and Kathy Olson. We have one more event this week, noon Friday. So if you're not signed up, please do so by visiting our website at sherwoodparkchamber.com. And please tell others as well. To all, take care, stay safe, and be kind, please. Thank you very much.